Hi everyone, welcome back from lunch. And you know Andy, and I'm uh, Chen Zhang Yi. And a um, little bit of our friendship is because uh, I wrote a piece, a saxophone piece, um, and that was a couple years ago. And when I wrote that piece, uh, it was for National Gallery, some sort of uh, project. And uh, we needed a saxophonist. And, and so we, I, I found Andy uh, at Sota. I talked to him after a concert. And so uh, then we started to uh, work on it. But before that, while I was writing that piece, I came across uh, Nicholas R. Huber's uh, saxophone solo piece. So, so I, I started uh, it kind of uh, briefly while I was uh, composing my uh, work. And um, so after that, I talked to Andy a little bit about this, a little bit with Peter. So, uh, and then this symposium came out and I thought, okay, okay, I can do something that involves saxophone. So this was the first thing that came out to my mind. And um, yeah, so I was Schmerz und Trauer. Um, I think it translates to um, of pain and sorrow. And um, from the piece itself, you can't really tell what is the pain and the sorrow. Uh, it's, I think it's like a hidden uh, meaning that's uh, for the composer. And um, this, uh, this blurb I, I wrote while kind of looking at the whole piece and what, what he does with uh, meter and rhythm. So that's quite intriguing. And um, so I came up with some um, ideas on how he was treating time differently. And um, we had the score already from the library, so, so I didn't think to look online. And uh, this morning I thought, okay, maybe I should look online, type this piece out. And I saw that uh, Nicholas R. Huber had wrote a blurb on the piece, but it's in German. So I translated it online, and uh, this is how it looks like. I had Peter read through it. I think he, he said this is pretty accurate. And so I was glad that some of these points were quite, uh, um, I, I, would not, I was not totally off track. So um, what's interesting is uh, this thing about rhythm and what he does with meter and notes that repeat, ideas that metamorph um, morph into um, different ideas and back. So there's this idea of loop where uh, the, the motif transforms to somewhere else very different and then it comes back. So um, maybe we should just hear the opening um, by Andy. Uh, she's going to play the first three lines. If we look at the first bar, um, I was quite intrigued by this because uh, it looks pretty obvious and simple. Uh, starting, starting out three notes, two notes, one note. Okay, it adds up to four, four bar. Okay, immediately in the second bar, uh, you, you can't really put a time signature, signature to it anymore. Uh, there's this very short note uh, in a very loud dynamic, different from that scale that descends. And then there's another scale that ascends, and then two notes. So it, it can kind of roughly approximate like uh, second bar perhaps is 5 4, and the third bar is 4 4 again. And then uh, in the second line, we have uh, some sort of 3 4 plus two very short notes. So um, this is what I have uh, tried to 
do and with uh, just looking at the piece without these interruptions, without these uh, glitches, I would call them, um, with this metrical approximation, such as like roughly what what is the type signature of each of these. So um, what I looked at, okay, this is me being the orchestra musician, writing lines on each beat. So uh, group your rhythm by the beat, all right, students. Okay, we have 4-4, four, 5-4, four. 4-4 four, four. Four, four again, 3-4, and then with a long high note, new idea, crescendo, and uh, the, the scale going down is 2-4-4, four, four, and then we have 3 plus 3, so 6-4, two, 2-4, four. now we have double dotted, the third line, and uh, we have 6-8 six, again, 6-4, uh, six, six, this one ad actually adds up, yes, with the double dotted. Then we have a new uh, idea, the grace notes, which is not uh, accountable normally in a, in a rhythmic sense in a, in a bar. Okay, so then, um, so we've got that approximations, uh, and then we add in the glitches. So um, this is, uh, I think, what uh, is called uh, this rhythmic modulation where you modulate the meter or modulate the rhythm by um, buying time or making time, adding uh, uh, with this additive idea of editing, adding short notes or short durations to or taking away uh, some durations from a bar, from a measure. Okay, so, um, so this this is what it looks like. It's usually uh, one of these notes. You, you, s you can maybe think of those glitches or these short notes, short attacks, as one of these three attacks, right? So then he's, he's really interacting these two ideas, the short note idea and then the long note idea, right? Staccato versus legato. And, and then with that, we can also see, uh, with the same music, contrapuntal layers with dot values, with articulation, with dynamics, register. And um, there was this article that Peter had um, translated um, from German. Oh, thank, thank, thank God for that. Uh, and <laughs> and um, Nikos Alphuber talked about uh, his uh, inner polyphony of a Bach uh, sonata and partita is a courant from the D minor suite. So uh, then he's um, obviously interested in the counterpoint or the hidden counterpoint within single lines. So uh, uh, me as well as a violinist from my, from a <laughs> my previous life, um, kind of curious on uh, what, what can be done contrapuntally uh, with one, just one single instrument, right? So um, this is my uh, sort of analysis of what he's trying to do here. You have the three hits with the triplets, we have two hits, uh, but here the two hits is an uh, upbeat and a downbeat. And we get to do that. That's similar to the Quran with the one note upbeat to the downbeat. Then we have one note upbeat. And then we have the scale, the glitch, the ascending scale, two hits. Now we combine these two, legato and the short notes, right? Then we get a double dotted rhythm. So he's interacting these two um, materials together. Then we have, uh, in a, that was pretty much the middle range, and then we have a high range, long notes with crescendo, with a nachschlag, with a afterbeat or a upbeat at the end, scale down with glitch, high dotted minimum or high long notes with this uh, glitches. It, it, was, it sounds pretty much like uh, upbeats, right? But it, it works uh, d d slightly differently it's because it's not in a regular meter. So I think that's, uh, and, and of course this bar, it uh, is in a regular double dotted, uh, almost like a French overture, bum, bum, that kind of thing, over dotted uh, leaps, right? And with leaps, now he's playing with the ranges, now the very lowest la range with uh, all this incorporated now within the uh, pretty much uh, s s one, two, three, four, five, six, six, four plus a little bit, right? Um, now he switches around the dynamics, 
right? So uh, usually the short note gets the loud dynamic. Here he has the long note getting the, dyna uh, the loud dynamic here. So he's really playing with our flipping around what is upbeat, what is downbeat. What is, who gets the loud uh, articulation, who gets the soft uh, dynamic. And then finally the grace note idea. And with that, he brings us back to the opening of the staccato hits. Now, if you remember the first bar, it's now the upbeat. And then, it's, uh, uh, okay, this is similar here, yeah? It's, uh, upbeat to the strong beat, and then this is a kind of uh, weak beat, strong beat. So he should have uh, beamed this together, all right? So this one belongs, this the semi quaver belongs to the previous one, okay? Uh, so I, I could add a line here, if I was a good orchestra musician, I would write a, add a line here. Okay, should we hear that again now with, uh, with this kind of different layers that we can uh, kind of see from the first three lines? So uh, this, this is um, uh, Prof. Edward's uh, translation of uh, the discussion between Spalinger uh, on Uber. Uh, this is the, the document that he mentioned earlier today, where all the students had to read. Um, so this is the part that uh, mentions Huber, and um, I've made the important words a bit larger. So um, he compares it to developing variation. So it's as, a, as a method, as a process of uh, developing the material, uh, you add certain notes, you change certain things, and then you morph it to the next thing. So um, in a way, it's like the developing variation. Um, but one, make, uh, one big difference is from the traditional one is that the, the backdrop, the, the structure of the meter, doesn't change in the traditional sense. But here, Hoover is like um, creating a sense of atonality. He's creating a sense of a meter. So a metrical kind of thinking where any note that you add additive rhythm is adds to the minimum or adds to the crotchet and, and it's okay to not have a simple meter. So like you could have a three, four plus one sixteen, for example. All right. Um, and this um, the larger words you can read, every intervention, every variation changes the beat and the meter. And this is the example he uh, they mentioned, a very simple example of three quarter notes. And then how do we change that gradually into two, four? Uh, so I've, I've typed that out. Um, in a version of that, this, this could be uh, what, is, uh, what Spallinger is talking about. Um, uh, intermediate stage of 5A, it starts with 3-4, you have a 5A in the middle, and then gradually at the end, uh, you take out the third beat entirely, you only have 2-4. So this is how it looks like with what uh, is mentioned in the text. And of course, if you wanted to um, put time signatures, meters to the in, in, in between bars, you could. What, what could that be? Maybe some of the students? can give it a shot. What would the second bar uh, be? Zutao? Sorry, did you say something? Yes, 
indeed, uh, 2.754. Uh, okay, good. So, uh, <laughs> 2, 4 plus uh, 0.75 or 2, 4 plus 360, right? 360 notes. Yes, exactly. So, uh, and, and this is, um, that is the example in the Spalinger conversation, and this is the example in our uh, Schmidt's own uh, trial. And uh, exactly, so 2, 4 plus 3, 16, and then the next one will be 5, 8, and then 2, 4 plus 1, 16, and then uh, from that we have a subtractive um, rhythm, and that uh, modulates the rhythm. Okay? And uh, shall we hear it? Uh, just these three bars um, by Andy. <laughs> Ask the same question. Um, the first bar I will tell you is three four, and um, what is the second bar? Now, um, Joan. <laughs> Two four plus three sixteen. Yes, but uh, it's not exactly the same way right, where the three sixteen is. Okay. Yes, that could work. One, oh so she says one four plus three sixteen plus one four. Uh, exactly. I think I think that's exactly it. And uh, this is how I would think if I was Andy trying to play this. So uh, thinking uh, absolutely just sixteen notes. So one two three four one two three. Oh, takatini 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 takita takatini takatitola takatini tak. Okay, sorry, I switched systems in the middle. Tala uh, Piccola, <laughs> <laughs> okay, or Taka uh, Takita, right? So the fi for the five. So I, I think that's uh, how um, this works here in the music. Uh, do you agree? Yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I think that's, that's the beauty of uh, rhythmic modulation. Um, so um, as some of you know, my... my um, Doctoral um, document was on Elliot Carter, and uh, I have never came across this when I was doing that. And Elliot Carter was known for metric modulation, which is uh, like changing meters, uh, changing tempi, accelerando, decelerando, uh, different levels of speeds. So with a speed, you have regular pulses. So this is totally different from that. It's, it's trying to get away from regular pulses as far as possible. So. Um, so I so I think that's the that's the beauty with this uh, um, rhythmic modulation. Um, okay, so this is the other piece for Unzuruk. Uh, in the blurb that I uh, submitted, I said it was composed in the same year. I lied; it's not. Uh, it was written one year prior, um, before, so um, 1981, and it was published in 1982. That's why I got the years wrong. But uh, nevertheless, four and two, it gives us an idea. But because remember that the, the the first idea, tram, 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 we have on the beat three notes, and then we have an upbeat, downbeat, and then another upbeat, right? So it's, it's thinking about the beats a little bit like how <laughs> Andy was talking about the you know where where in where the in the the, the kind of metrical beat that, that it lies. Is it before? Is it on? Is it after? Okay, so this is an example, a uh, very, very similar opening of the oboe piece. Joking with Howard that uh, this is for him. Um, <laughs> so um, yes, so the same kind of thinking. Now that you have practiced a little bit with that previous piece, you can kind of see how uh, Huber is thinking, right? So um, he starts 
simple always in these two pieces at least. So what meter does he start with? Four four, thank you. <laughs> Good, four four, right? Uh, and and again, he uh, I I somehow he's he's exploring this idea between the downbeat and the upbeat and the downbeat or the pickup or the re repetition of certain notes. Uh, so that's uh, certainly true in the uh, the other article that uh, Prof Edwards had uh, translated. Um, so uh, w with the Bach example, right? So then in the second second bar we have a contrasting idea, and that gives us sort of. Uh, uh, also very interesting, the te tempo change is, you know, quarter note and it becomes quaver, crotchet becomes quaver, one, three, eight. So actually, um, he could have rewritten the first bar. Um, uh, anyway, so the second bar, we immediately uh, have a different meter. So if any of you had played any Hinder Myth or like um, some like Samuel Barber, the composers during like in, in the mid-1900s, like to not to use the meter change, uh, even if the meters were normal, like six eight to five eight to seven eight and three four 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 five four. Uh, so I, uh, this is kind of nece necessary in this piece to to kind of not put the meter that. So here, um, uh, what we have is two plus one plus two plus one plus three plus two, uh, without any hierarchical meter of the beat, right? Um, um, sense of the beat. Uh, it, it brings to mind um, the percussion piece, um, you know, what, what's that piece called? Safa, right? That uh, is written on a graph paper and with that, we just see the hits and we don't have a preconceived idea of which is the downbeat, which is the upbeat. So here, um, even though we can kind of one and the two and the three and the four and roughly, it's a of eight, right, with one missing at the end. And then we have, uh, again, he does it the same process. One of the notes of the first idea becomes the glitch. Here he gives us a 116 bar, and then we go back to the one and one, two, three, one. And then ta -ta -ta again, right? And then here he, he kind of gives us even more subdivisions. So, this is what I kind of came out with, with the B-flat, the low voice, this is the lowest note of the oboe. And uh, nice orchestration because it's easy to play loud in the lower range, um, in case you didn't know, for the students. Um, okay, so 4-4, four, four, and then we have one of those short notes, the pickup perhaps, and then we have the quaver, the third note perhaps, then we have um, the first note, maybe, the three sixteen notes, the dotted, which is like the first note, but here he has um, very challenging to play, perhaps put a PP to that note, but uh, according to Howard, this is an amazing oboe player, so, um, so maybe we hear it again um, after, afterwards. So we have 11-8, we have 11-8, but different grouping, yeah? This is 2 plus 3 plus 1 and then 5. It's like a 5 8 with a dotted rhythm. Now we are thinking it's uh, 16 notes, right? Semi, semi quavers. So it's a little bit like 1, 2, 2, 2 semi quavers, 3 semi quavers, 5 semi quavers. 2 plus 3 plus 5, so 10. 10, 16, 5, 8. Okay, we have 6 8, half of that, uh, 12 8 in the, in the beginning. And then uh, this, how did I come up with 11 8? Uh, you have to count the semi quavers. So, um, so obviously not very helpful if you put this for this bar, right? So um, another way to see it is uh, this: nine eight plus two eight, five eight plus three four, two plus three plus five sixteen, three plus two plus one eight, and then here we count the sixteen notes: three plus six plus five plus two. So I, I, th I really think that this is how uh, he's kind of grouping this in a, in a rhythmic modulation. And uh, let's hear it again. I 
hope with that you had kind of increased your inner counting, <laughs> with your subdivision, counting the subdivisions. Uh, at some points, you, you need to really count in 16 notes to play this. And that, uh, that inner pulse is something uh, that will come up uh, uh, also in later. Another example in, in the saxophone piece. All right, so that is that. And another excerpt from... Uh, I, I thought this was very, very funny, uh, that the, the way that they, they said something. One one pulse, like a one quarter note, a one crotchet per bar. Pulse is not ametric, uh, but on the contrary. So, so here, Spallinger is actually uh, criticizing Huber's uh, technique here uh, in, in a sense where uh, one one is as ametric as the tone that always repeats is atonal. So if you repeat, you repeat a note, it doesn't mean that it doesn't make it atonal or it doesn't make it tonal. So one one uh, it depends. It depends, <laughs> all right. And uh, uh, this is okay. This is um, him saying that about the rhythmic modulation. It is ametric and uh, negating certain things, right? Uh, in the sense that atonality is negating the sense of a key. So here in a uh, um, amatric music, you you kind of negating the sense of a regular pulse. But then the last, the last part, stroke by stroke. So shall we hear some of this one one music or repeated notes? And this is uh, page four. Uh, page four is the first page, by the way, of, of the music, uh, line six to nine. Andy. So uh, here we, we have that grace note uh, idea lead into this repeated C sharps, uh, the written C sharps, and, and that uh, slows down. So um, in a sense, we, we don't we hear the pulse for a while, maybe six seven beats, and then we we slow down a little bit into uh, easing into this jazz phrasing. Um, I thought it's nice that Andy played this example, and <laughs> and that jazz uh, kind of feeling of rhythm. He's he's written uh, the three uh, the the triplets here, but I think he really wanted the player to make it sound like swing, um, and and it goes back to that uh, quarter note scale ascent with short notes pick up or glitches, and then he takes away some notes uh, subtractive you know like a cellarando again, and then it takes away more of the long notes, and it becomes just the long and the short long and the short long short long short. So it's a bit like the if you are familiar with like iambic, trochee, all those um, you know poetic meters. Uh, he's he's kind of playing with that long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short. And and here I thought this most beautiful part, which which he doesn't write it out, but here uh, he says repeat ten, uh, nine times while doing poco ritardando, uh, dotted becomes equal through this nine times of repetition. So what does that mean? That means in the middle of this nine times, from the dotted, it will become somewhat a triplet, like, um, and then somewhere between there, depends on what, how you define swing rhythm, you will get the swing rhythm in the middle of it. And then you get to the even, pulse, the e even uh, repetition of notes. 
Uh, but it's not even yet because you have accent and turn you to still strong weight, strong weight, strong weight. So in the next repetition, he does the uh, ex, uh, articulation change. So from strong weight, strong weight, strong weight, strong weight, strong weight. So at the end, we hear just equal notes. At the end. So again, we have a cycle from equal pulses, and uh, at the end of this example, is also again equal pulses. Cool. I thought it's very cool. Um, and then uh, everything is very fluid. He, he changes the material, but then it is always very smooth. So I think that's, that's uh, a part of that beauty of uh, just having subtle variations while he repeats certain motifs. And then we, we look at the grace notes idea. Uh, uh, when you are playing grace notes, right? Uh, if you've played grace notes before in uh, your older music, early music, regular, um, you know, con common practice music. Uh, so it's, it's where, okay, um, you have to decide, it, does it come before the bar line, or is it on the bar line, or is it uh, before and after on the bar line reaching, where do you reach the, the main note, right? So this is kind of in the negative space, or the stolen time within the bar, right? So it's also part of this buying time where you have to squeeze it out of the bar. Uh, of course, all this works very well for solo writing because you, you decide your own time, right? And um, here he develops that. You see that uh, Peugeot idea, he gets smaller and smaller intervals and then he, he brings that back. He brings that back here before um, this repeated C-sharps. So um, that is, we, we could hear it as ornamental. But then by the moment we go uh, to page six, this is the third page of the music, page four is the first page of the music, then we see that the same idea now gets developed as real notes. And, uh, he's, he, and he says, starts with Lauren, which is sweet and uh, with a sense of loss. Is that for Lauren? Loss, loss yes, good. Um, yeah, so... Um, then he develops that as a uh, as um, triplets in a way. Okay, shall we hear that? Sure. Um, just both examples. Uh, mix of both. Yeah. So page four first. Shall we hear that? Just the grace notes. <laughs> Page six, the top of page six, uh, we hear that slowed down. I have a question for the students again. Uh, what if we took out some rest from these triplets? So if we have a bar of um, these uh, two groups of triplets, right? But we don't have all six of it. We only have uh, two of it or four of it. How would you mark that bar? The meter, yeah. So if we if we took out this um, this two quavers from this bar, but it's still the same triplets, and you have to put a meter to it. Okay, so that is the next topic, <laughs> which is uh, irrational meters. Okay, so um, just just a tangential. I th I think. Uh, um, Interesting for, for us uh, because Huber, Huber does his rhythmic modulation in a way that uh, is different from, uh, let's say, uh, Thomas Ardus. So Thomas Ardus likes to add this kind of four, six irrational meters to his music. So that creates a different, slightly different kind of uh, uh, rhythm and meter in, um, 
in uh, new music. All right, so uh, this is this is it. The grace notes repeating, uh, reprising as uh, reprising as triplets. Now uh, the four on two really uh, reminded me of the four schlag and the uh, nachschlag of uh, this uh, ornamentation in early music. So this is a uh, um, treatise by uh, Quantz about the the art of playing the flute. And uh, this is a translation that uh, I've worked with. And I can show you the book quickly. It looks like this. This is my translated version. And um, there's two um, two kinds of uh, forschla, which is uh, one is the accented, one is the uh, passing. So um, on the right side, you have the accented on beat. And then on the left side, you have the passing upper jaw to us uh, or uh, four schlags, right? Um, so the first one uh, is the passing one. So five and six is the same thing. The six is the uh, how it should be played according to quants. So it's okay, before the beat as passing notes. Okay, and then uh, the on beat, Will be it's on the beat, yeah. So it's accented, and yeah. Okay. So why? How does that matter? It, I think it corresponds to how uh, Hoover is thinking about his material here. What is the pickup? What is the on beat? Can how can I play with it so that I switch it around and back? So uh, this is uh, just to um, be clear. Nachschlag is the termination of a trill. So it's, it's not that when the <laughs> grace note happens after the beat, but it has to be like really after the uh, ornaments. So, so the last two notes is the termination. It's called the Nachschlag. Okay, um, just, just to do the before and after. Um, all right, so uh, what he says here is uh, sometimes it's written out, sometimes it's written out as grace notes, sometimes it's not written out. Um, according to quants, okay, and uh, grace notes uh, as another layer of uh, counterpoint. Uh, we mentioned the inner polyphony, inner counterpoint of like Bach and Baroque music. So this is. Um, should I play the oboe one first? Okay, I play the oboe one first. This is from Four und Zurück, and uh, if you listen to uh, how the grace notes. Maybe add another layer. Okay, so here we do experience that one, uh, one beat per bar <laughs> phenomenon here uh, with many, many repeats. This is a 1-8 re with repetitions. And here with all these repeated notes, uh, obviously we, uh, we can hear and uh, see the dynamic uh, scheme and accents in a little bit like uh, in an old, older way of uh, kind of regrouping in the Stravinskian kind of style where you have uh, maybe 3 plus 2, 2 plus 3, that kind of uh, you know, Petrushka um, grouping. Uh, but also the grace notes uh, do give us that stolen sense of time where the, these other voices create like, oh, there's other things happening at the same time while this pulse is going on. 
And um, I think the the okay, there's the ritardando that's there as well, similar to similar to the saxophone example. And then at the end, we we do hear more of this diminished chord. I think that's uh, his reference to Beethoven in this piece. And uh, we have similar um, kind of a process with the grace notes as um, in the counterpoint in the saxophone example. Um, so maybe you can hear it from Andy. the same uh, kind of texture with the uh, hidden polyphony with uh, created by the grace notes. Uh, there's a slide here. Um, then uh, at the very end with this repeats, this uh, kind of morphing from low grace notes to uh, the staccato, staccatissimo, and then flipping it around in the middle is quite equal. And then by the end, the low note becomes the long note, and then the higher note becomes the grace note. So he's he's doing that, flipping around what is four and what is before the beat and what's on the beat, or what is short, what is long, and what is the upbeat, what is the uh, downbeat. So it's, it's quite cool, I thought. Um, kind of uh, twisting our minds around <laughs> uh, this um, rhythmic. Um, or the per the per uh, perception of what is strong beat, what is on beat, what is off beat. Okay, and this is the Bach example. Um, repeated note, pick up to the chord. Okay, we're here um, from Netherlands Bach Society, the Courant. <laughs> very interesting from this example was that he was trotting the repetition of this A's of uh, the different levels of the A's which is the 5 which is the dominant of D minor uh, so we have a lot of the middle range and then we have some of the low and we have some of the high and then he was uh, I, th I thought what was interesting with this was that um, the, the polyphony of um, a single line instrument uh, with the use of the different ranges, middle, low, and high, he could create uh, different voices. And uh, that brings us back to this uh, saxophone piece, which really uh, he makes use of that very well, uh, as well as the oboe piece, right? Where the low has one character, the middle has another character, the high has another character. And, and this uh, different motifs uh, get circled around and uh, transformed and but, but at the same time, when we hear um, the music, there's many, many layers. So that is the simultaneity and the beauty of, of that. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is where he makes it super obvious, where he writes the music in different staves. This is uh, in the saxophone piece, uh, page 10, lines 4 to 5, um, the just the lower two.
Um, uh, if you if you list look at the score, um, it probably was easier to uh, notice the different voicing when the, the notes had different articulation, right? So from the short notes, even though loud, soft, loud, soft, uh, it's harder to um, hear it um, compared to when is the legato ten tenuto uh, line, the scale, the descending scale, right? So um, I, th I really, uh, when I was studying this piece, I, I followed this in the saxophone piece I wrote for Andy, and uh, you can check it out. He plays very nicely in that recording called Life by the River. So uh, yeah, contrapunto layers, simultaneity, and all these different ideas coming together, even though it's just one instrument, right? And then we have our um, Andy's uh, topic <laughs> of the jazz phrasing. Um, shall we hear that again? This is... Uh, first page, right? Uh, uh, seven, uh, line seven. about that just now, right? So this is uh, kind of the spectrum of the strong week, strong week, where uh, at, the at the end of it, um, dotted becomes swing, and then at the end, very uh, regular pulse, equal pulse. So this is uh, writing it out, uh, spelling it out here. And uh, finally, we have uh, long notes. Uh, in a way, the inner pulse that we hear before in the subdivisions. Uh, now, if you stretch it out, augment it in the in the uh, um, this section where it's quite quite slow. If you look at the, uh, it's quite intricate marking of the dynamic scheme where it, it should change like almost like terrace dynamics on each quarter note beat, each quarter beat. Yeah. So, um, Andy, you want to show us how this sounds like? Maybe just. Um, a few lines of that, sure. just the middle lines, yeah. So uh, we talked about the repeated notes uh, already, and um, this is uh, quite similar in uh, the approach. There's some uh, triplets here, and he takes out some, and then uh, from from the triplets, he um, has uh, all his numbers are uh, timbre changes. So uh, use alternate uh, fingerings to get different tone colors, uh, while the notes uh, p uh, the pitch stays the same, and then we go back to that uh, original uh, repeated note. Ta -dum, ta -da -dum. Um, yeah, don't have to play that. You can uh, look at this uh, repeated note um, on the on a single B. This is in the um, oboe example. Yeah.
went to that section that we heard before. So uh, what I thought uh, was interesting here, not, not just the, the uh, kind of syncopation where the accents were placed, um, is the silences. We almost hear that the rhythm is still going on while the silences are added, are added in here. So kind of counting the silences here. Two, three, two, two, three, two, three, three, four, um, kind of subdivisions of silences. All right. So uh, this is the last thing I want to share with you. And uh, should we? Uh, okay. I think I think I will just I will just um, show you what uh, I thought of this page, and then Andy can play parts of it. So uh, this is uh, near the end of the piece. Um, And we have the ascending scale, and then we have the jazz phrasing, uh, and then um, with elongated um, of uh, long notes into five subdivisions, uh, five sixteenth notes, and then we have the ascending runs, uh, but now it's into septuplets. And then we finally have some sort of Carter moment, Elliot Carter, metric modulation, where the, the septuplet becomes the new tempo, and then we have the glitches here, we have the repetitions of each bar, but then slightly different number of, uh, of uh, notes. So like uh, here it will be 8, six, uh, eight 16, uh, and then here will be 6, 16, and so on. So a little bit like Andreessen's uh, Workers' Union here. And then uh, this is the most beautiful part, I think, uh, where this five notes, da 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 Gradually, he elongates certain notes, and finally, with enough notes elongated, we get back to the original scaling ascent with the uh, glitches. So, shall we hear that from Andy? <laughs> Ascending lines, ascending scales reminded yeah. me a lot of walking bass lines in jazz. That's something that you can hear the bass do a lot of graph. <laughs> interesting because uh, when I mentioned this piece to Peter, he was like, no, no way, no way Huber is, is, has done some jazz inflected stuff in his music. Yeah, but I, I think it, it makes sense in this piece because he's trying to do that, uh, the whole 
you know, uh, downbeat, upbeat thing, uh, you know, and then kind of it's right in the middle of the swing rhythm. Yeah, and also the the articulations, right? All the all the quarter notes are marked uh, tenuto and accented. That's exactly how a bass would play, right? So long and with with a strong attack. That's why it sounds like that. I mean, for me. Cool. Thanks, Andy. Is it because of like the jazz background? That's why, like, when you are seeing these uh, changes in like the time, that you notice the swing rhythm and you bring out the swing rhythm even more. Or is it like you feel that most musicians who are just pick up on this and then they're just doing? That's a good question. I think what whatever you do in your musical life, whatever influence you have, whatever experience you have, helps you play better. Uh, Maybe you know somebody that plays both jazz and classical music um, has another vision of how to make uh, this piece sound and how to make it swing. You know, but I mean, there's lots of swing in classical music too. But, uh, you know, if it's played right, so I'm not sure that just the jazz background itself uh, does it. Okay. Have a question. Uh, at the start, while we were discussing all the electric bars. Seemingly multiple time signatures in one bar. What is the implication that Uber has of cramming all these multiple groupings in one bar rather than dividing it into multiple bars that is more symmetric? I think he's just making, uh, he's just giving us the pause but then taking it away and uh, giving us a false sense of, okay, maybe this is regular, but no, I'm going to throw in this thing, thing, and this thing, take away this beat or that beat. Then we have. Uh, irregularity and that uh, I think is part of his whole process in this piece so that, that's the whole point of it and um, yes uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, can I ask one question? Yes. Is uh, Google also use the same technique in the orchestra? Like the orchestra has like a different Oh does he? I, I, I just want to ask because well, I'm not an expert quite challenging for conductors so. Oh yeah I would imagine it's, uh, it'd yeah. be hard to I Good question. I, I do not uh, know. <laughs> I yeah, I'm very curious to find out actually. Yeah, but th this piece I just got to know about and uh, really get into um, this uh, this year, and as well as the oboe piece. I, I think it really works well uh, for solo, maybe for chamber, but for orchestra it would be quite challenging. Uh, well, I th actually actually this this morning uh, with uh, with examples that Hannah shared. There was quite a bit of those three, four plus one sixteens. So um, I think it's just a matter of ensemble, and then the conductor just gives the downbeat <laughs> when they line up together. But it's quite interesting in a way, the, the eighteen beats in time and the eighteen in between. Yes. But for the orchestra, musician will be quite challenging to Yeah. So I'm not sure they'll enjoy it as much as we do. Yeah, that was okay. But uh, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure some orchestra can play it. So uh, it's a challenge we can uh, maybe we train our opus nobis to do that. <laughs> right, thank you very much. Uh, we are out of time. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Howard.
for Takamitsu. Um, so Takamitsu, um, I should always learn to quote my slides now, was born in uh, 1930 in Japan, uh, and he's arguably, or arguably remains, the most internationally recognized post-war Japanese composer. His earliest works were highly influenced by European music, but over the course of his career, he came to incorporate aesthetic elements of Japanese culture in his music. He neither sought to imitate the sound of Japanese music, nor synthesize European and Japanese traditions. Instead, he aimed to highlight the distinctions of these two musical traditions within his work. One thing I admire about Takamitsu is his understanding that culture runs deeper than superficial traits found in the artworks of a region or an era. We can see this in the composer's writings on Japanese, the Japanese sense of time, as well as the applications of this in his own artistic output. This lecture will first outline the arguments presented in two articles by Takamitsu, my perception of time in traditional Japanese music, as well as one sound. Following this, we'll look at excerpts of Takamitsu's music to see examples of how the composer integrated Japanese tradition in his work. In my perception of time in traditional Japanese music, Takamitsu begins by addressing the perception of sound. For him, a combination of elements influence sound, including temperature and space, humidity, amongst other things, and it results in timbre. He argues that although one can speak of timbre in physical terms, one can't abstract, quote, the touch or the feel of timbre as it permeates a particular climate and is refined as, as it passes through time. He writes, the sensing of timbre is none other than the perception of the succession of movement within sound. To put it another way, timbre arises during the time in which one is listening to the shifting of sound. It is, as symbolized by the word sawari, indicative of a dynamic state. Sawari, by the way, means to touch something lightly and is a term associated with the arts. Indeed, the idea of a sound in dynamic state is not unique to Japanese music, nor is it only an inspiration to Takamitsu. We shift to Korea for a second. The Korean composer, Lee sang Yoon, termed an important component of his compositional approach, Hauptklang, or main sound, in German because he spent his, most of his artistic career actually in Germany. And this features a central tone from which the composer deviated and returned, varied with microtonality, vibrato of different widths, as well as different articulations. And we can hear this in works like Piri and Sori from Yoon. We'll hear um, Piri in a second. Piri is a, a, a traditional in, um, Korean instrument, which is sort of the uh, Korean equivalent of, or similar to oboe. And sori does not mean sorry. <laughs> In Korean, it means sound. So sorry, but it means sound. Yeah, so let's take a listen to this. And, and Yoon actually talked about this, um, this idea deriving from his understanding of traditional court music from Korea, uh, music that would have been, would have been a thousand years old. Okay, that didn't work. Maybe I have to press this.
Uh, Yun and Takamitsu, however, were composers with unique visions. And while their cultures shared this trait, their music differs significantly. Still, we can take Yoon's music as an additional confirmation of the intimate link between timbre and time in certain art traditions in Asia. Returning to Takamitsu's article, the composer continues by contrasting senses of time in Western and Japanese culture. He writes, whereas in the West one gets the feeling that different spaces exist at the same time in Japan, in such places as the ancient capitals Nara and Kyoto, one senses the synchronic existence of different, differing flows of time. It seems as if the state of temporal continuance in the two cultures is of different quality. To demonstrate his point, Takamitsu describes European buildings as something that overcomes the flow of time. This is due to both their size and the material used to build them. They're often larger than their environment and made of stone, whereas in Japanese traditional uh, Japan, Japanese traditional buildings are, are sized to fit their environment and made of wood. Uh, we should remember that before the Second World War, buildings in Tokyo, for instance, were largely made of wood. It's very different than the, the landscape of Tokyo today. Uh, Takamitsu argues that Western architecture, quote, occupies space in resistance to nature. And Japanese architecture possesses a tendency to share space in common with nature. He states that with Western architecture, it is just as if time accumulates in a linear fashion from the points of these seemingly unbreakable buildings towards the depths of their centers. From Takamitsu's perspective, the Japanese see, quote, nature as well as man as entities that live and die within a world of time. The Western conception of time is linear, but in Japan, time is perceived as a circulating and repeating entity. Um, and here I have a, I, I don't know where this is from, uh, what building, but this is, this uh, looks like every city in the world today, right? This could be Singapore, it could be Tokyo, it could be New York, it could be Chicago. Um, so, but we do, uh, the reason I chose this picture is we have, some, we have some trees in the bottom there, and over this are then another 80 stories of building. That is, this is a, a perfect example, I think, of what Takamitsu was getting at, that this is, this is uh, a building that stands in opposition to nature. And if we were to compare that to a building like this, for instance, also a large building, right, but this is uh, a three-story building, that, but you notice that it's built into the side of a mountain where the mountain is actually it's sort of enveloped by the trees and, the, and the, the, the size of the mountain in a way defines the size of the building. Similarly, something like this, we see how this, is, this, this shrine is basically woven into nature. We have wonderful places, by the way, in Southeast Asia where we see things falling apart. I don't mean that as a criticism. I don't mean like, oh, cities or something like that. I mean really natural places. If you've ever been to, for instance, the, to, to, to Angkor, where you see these ancient buildings that are actually in, you know, a thousand years old and, and are not maintained. Um, uh, maybe there's some maintenance now, but that's maybe at the main buildings. We, we see in some of the smaller temples, for instance, this, this amazing transformation that's taking place. We see buildings in the middle of being overtaken by nature again. right? <laughs> And we see, for instance, if you go to Balinese temples, for instance, because of climate and because of, the, because of the stones that they use, the thing is constantly just being sort of, it's like parts of it are being replaced as parts of it fall apart. Or a little bit like the Dome Cathedral, which they joke is never finished because, because by the time they finish one part of it, another part of it, so huge, another part of it has to be replaced. So it's a building that's 500 years old, but it's never been finished. Developing his point further, Takamitsu then argues that Western music exists within a time scheme that is linear and single-layered. And in contrast, he offers up Bunraku theater as an example of how multiple time layers exist simultaneously in the Japanese arts. Bunraku is a traditional Japanese puppet theater. Where rather than speaking roles, Bunraku tells its stories through a narrator called a tayu. A, Jap a shamisen player accompanies the narration and the puppetry. But the relationship between the tayu and the shamisen play player involves competition. So here we have our, our tayu on the left and our shamisen player on the right. As a tayu acquaintance of Takamitsu once told him, the tayu does, does his best to narrate in an ill-natured and spiteful manner. 
so as to make it difficult for the shamisen performer to play. For his part, the shamisen player takes this hindrance in his stride and fits his part to the narrative in a casual and non-obtrusive fashion. So this competition is part of Bunraco's aesthetic. Through the player's efforts to compete, yet also support each other to produce the drama, Takamitsu writes, a relationship of irregular time as expressed by words such as iki and ma is produced. So let's watch a bit of Bunraku to get an idea of what's what, what, what we're talking about here. That's a uh, choral part. So, but th th we heard that in, in that minute and a half or so, we hear the the. Well, we can see also we see the 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 puppeteer or puppeteers here um, interacting with the Taiyu's narration and and the shamisen. Um, and in this expert, we hear the Taiyu and, sh and Shakohachi player maintaining individual senses of time. There are some points of synchronization, but there's a great deal of freedom in each artist's pulse. Now, from a Western perspective, in which musicians traditionally synchronize, these two artists might initially strike listeners as amateurs. Yet, the performers in this excerpt are from the National Bunraku Theater of Japan, so certainly they're some of the best in their respective fields. And there's this naturalness to the music, natural like when leaves are swept along by a breeze. There's a sense of freedom, grace, spontaneity, and yet also organization. It's a naturalness that takes a master to simulate through artifice. But iki and ma, what do these terms mean? I'll do my best, I'm not Japanese, so. I Google a lot though. So. Iki can mean breath, spirit, or style, but, it also, but it's associated with a muted, refined style. One that requires great effort and attention, but appears modest. In Bunraku, for instance, the interactions between the puppeteer, the shamisen player, and the taiyu yield a singer, single, superficially natural artistic result but the intricacies needed to create that is very complex. Ma is defined as negative space. It's fundamental to many Asian art traditions, placing what is absent on equal footing with what is present. The painting Pine Trees by Hosagawa Ta uh, Tohaku from roughly 1595 offers a good example. Uh, the work consists of six screens the left and rightmost panels are largely empty, but in the spirit of Ma, the space they provide the painting is equally important to that occupied by pine trees in the central four panels. However, a painting can only be a metaphor for Ma because it's a defined space, limited by the frame of the canvas. Takamitsu defines Ma as, quote, an unquantifiable metaphysical space of duration of dynamically tensed absence of sound. Well, what does that mean? If sound exists in time, and time is eternal, then ma becomes vast and incomprehensible. 
It becomes everything from which any sound arises. In this regard, a single stroke of a biwa string or a single tone on a shakuhachi arises from ma, and in so doing makes ma apparent. And what it expresses is its relationship to ma and moves, quote, toward an unnameable point beyond the personal. So as an example, Takamitsu shares that a shakuhachi player desires to create a sound like wind drawn from a grove of rotted and dry bamboo. That is, it's not a personal expression, it's an expression of nature. So herein lies the conundrum for Takamitsu. What do you use sound to express, how do you use sound to express your ideas when it exists only to come into life to express the nature of all sound and silence? Takamitsu writes, can I possibly add anything to this? If one restructures, reshapes, and polishes the legacy of hogaku uh, techniques, that is traditional Japanese music, which have been bequeathed to us, one acts without any relation to history. To be sure, any attempt to adapt Japanese instruments to Western norms amounts to a rather foolish acoustical fetishism and achieves nothing. Should not hogaku then be discarded as something unrelated? to our contemporary musical life and experience. Yet, along with other, many other musicals, musics of the world, Hogaku has seized my heart and refuses to release it. So, what a conundrum for an artist, to see plain-sightedly your choices and know that only failure awaits you if you take any of them. And this is what I admire about Takamitsu. He saw how irresolvable the aesthetics of East and West are and respected them as such, never succumbing to kitsch, superficial grafting of these two traditions, which we must admit is so commonplace today. As he put it, I must nurture within my own sensibility two dissimilar musics, Western and Japanese, which have grown from two different systems of original sonnet phenomena. The first step must be to use the various techniques of composition to make, cle to make clearly apparent the disparity between these musics, not to resolve the contradiction, but to intensify their opposition within myself so as to maintain a continual progression within a work. This is a step I take with extreme hesitation, but it's only through this practice that I can keep from falling into the role of a mere guardian of the grave of tradition. So, what did he do? And how does that relate to the unfolding of time in his music? Well, we can start with a solo flute piece. <laughs> and Carolyn's head pops up. <laughs> we can start with a solo flute piece <laughs> from 1971 called Voice. And with us today, there it is. Um, and with us today is Carolyn Rauser, who actually is with us for, for the whole half of the day because uh, at 4 she'll be playing in the lecture recital and at 7, 7.30 she'll be playing in a concert. She's the flutist of the Ensemble Chromosome who's here with us this week. Um, and she has kindly agreed to come and play for us the first page from this piece, this 1971 piece called Voice by Takamitsu. So I'm going to do the score so they can follow along as you play. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
So the work starts with a half spoken and half played figure. I'll go back for a second. Here. The text used in the piece is taken from Shuzo Takaguchi's Handmade Proverbs, which I actually only discovered the other day. I went to Jan's office and he has the choral things with this, the same thing, this Handmade Proverbs. He actually, there's like choral pop pieces or something. Like Takamitsu also, Takamitsu did a lot of film music as well. So it's, um, so it reads, Qui va la, qui que tu sois par la transparence? Who goes there? Speak transparency wherever you are. So the quote could be a reference to ma, or no sound, the transparent or invisible presence of sound. There's also, there are also compositional solutions like those illustrated in Islam Yun's Piri. Notice that held notes are granted greater complexity using glissando, dynamic change, multiphonic, dispiliando, the clearest example of this is the end of the fourth system. Let's see if we get that one. Yeah. Here, right up, right up in this area here. Here, an A is repeated with key click, flutter tongue, dispiliando, trill, multiphonic, and tremolo. The life of this sound is illustrated in its unfolding timbre, which requires time. This goes right back to the very first thing where Takamitsu was talking about timbre as the unfolding. Uh, as an unfolding that happens over time, and this is a really good example of that. This is then an illustration of what Takamitsu calls sawari, a dynamic state of shifting within a sound as demonstrated through the nature of timbre. Additionally, note, that, note the use of an ascending line to create trajectory in the music. This is not melodic music. There is no motive or development, but there is a recurring alternation between quick figuration and drawn out lines. This work shares characteristics with traditional shakuhachi music, but does that result from an intentional imitation or just a shared musical logic? One can't say conclusively, but given Takamitsu's writings, I believe that it's the latter reason. Um, a quick side note too, the thing, if you know Takamitsu's music, this is a very uh, aesthetically very unusual piece for Takamitsu. Actually, Takamitsu's music is often very much, uh, has a sort of very th modern French sound to it highly influenced by Debussy and Messiaen. Um, and, and that's not the surface of this music at all. Um, which I, I actually make, makes this piece quite interesting for me in sort of the history of his work. Uh, Toward the Sea is a three movement work for alto flute and guitar from the 1980s, or from 1980. And the second movement is entitled Moby Dick. And this is what we'll hear at the school here as well. We'll take a listen to the whole work.
Okay, so um, this work demonstrates some of the qualities that Takamitsu associates with Bunraku, namely Iki and Ma. Um, numerous events can be characterized as sound emerging from no sound and disappearing back into it. Mm. It's not what I wanted to do. Here we go. The first flute event contains, uh, containing the F and F sharp B is a good example. This phrase emerges out of the guitar's resonance and dies away with the fading resonance of the guitar's second phrase. Takamitsu grants individual notes life through changes to their timbre and articulation. In the third system, for instance, uh, the B first sounds with a fingering that produces a hollow tone. You see that on the top there. But uh, this is followed by a timbral change accomplished through a different fingering. And finally, a multiphonic is produced through overblowing. These timbral changes occur over a single crescendoing breath which glues these events together. Another good example is the second system on page eight, where the F sharp and the B flat alternate. When Takamitsu finally fixes on the F sharp, it is played with a bispigliando trill, then it expands to a tremolo between F sharp and B flat, and finally the B flat becomes the focal pitch, first flutter tonguing, and finally resolving to ordinario. Also note that this phrase clearly demonstrates how Takamitsu uses timbre and articulation along with dynamic to build tension and re or build and release tension. So the more common, even although this is a very harmonic music, the more common approach towards ma managing tension, tension through harmony is less present here. Uh, something related to the Japanese concept of iki, the seemingly natural, simple style created through considerable effort can be seen in the phrase performed by flute and guitar in systems two through four, which starts, starts, oops, I can't come to it, starts right here. While the phrase starts with flute and guitar simultaneously, there's a great deal of independence in the flow and unfolding of each part. Sometimes the parts align, like at the beginning of system three, and sometimes there's a sense of back and forth, I should move to that, Sometimes there's a sense of back and forth between the instruments, but there's also, there are also moments in which they seem to coexist independently from each other. The elements that vertically arrange time, that is meter and metrical grid, pulse, textural rolls, are either absent or they're redefined in this work. Note, for instance, that only guitar, by and large, has tempo markings, and hence the flutist aligns to the guitar part. So the half notes played by the flute aren't half notes per se, and actually we saw these uh, written as well in, inside of voice, even though it's a solo piece. They're just to be held while the guitar plays its part. These alignment points are like downbeats, however, they don't act like downbeats, since they have no metrical superiority. Right? So if we think about a meter, if we have a 4-4 four, four bar, our downbeat is always stronger than our second and third, uh, fourth beats, and our third beat is always stronger than the second and the fourth, but weaker than the first. That, that obviously isn't ha doesn't have any role here, but we do have these alignment points which sort of bring things together. There's another important aspect of temporal organization in Takamitsu's music that can be seen in the work's phrasing. Below is a chart, or not below, below in my paper, but here on the screen is a chart listing the length of each phrase. <laughs> Note the extreme variety here. So phrases are as short as two beats and up to almost 20 beats in length. And there's no pattern or way to predict the length. These little, you see the two times two happens twice. These are actually the ba -dum, ba -dum, that happens as this one that happens and then it gets repeated as a kind of echo. And this happens twice in the piece and they're exact, they're, they're exact imitations of each other. So which is also again structurally kind of interesting because that's not the nature of anything else in the piece. There's no repetitions, that there's no repetitions of particular phrases, either right next to each other or distance apart. So, ah, this is it, this is this two plus two. There are some recurrences with the short two beat phrases that are repeated once, phrase 11 being an exact repetition of phrase four. 
So as beautiful as the music is on its surface and as natural as it feels, looking at the phrasing of the work reveals a surprising level of spontaneity and unpredictability. Uh, determining, determining the exact length of a phrase is impossible in some cases due to Takamitsu's use of the half note with an extended beam. This is his notation for as long as necessary. It provides the players with a way to interact and influence the flow of time in the piece. It is usually used as a shorthand for notating the flute's duration. For instance, in system two here, where we have it, well, I have highlighted system one, but we see it also in system two. Um, the F held in the flute could have been notated since the guitar's duration is clear, but it's not notated that way. That for instance, well, that, that second phrase, for instance, could, could be of a particular length with a fermata over it, but that's not how Takamitsu wants these musicians to have, that's not the kind of relationship he wants to build into the notation for them. Uh, another example is at the end of system four where the flute's F starts and stops in alignment with the guitar note. So this is another strategy he uses where you see these these um, these vertical dotted lines to say when the flute begins and when the flute flute ends. Other places, its meaning isn't straightforward, or at least the interpretation of its length isn't so straightforward. For instance, here in the first system, this is page nine. How long should this D four and this C sharp six play? How long should they be played, especially with the C sharp six, which has the additional indication of shortly. So the same question arises with the F4 later in the same system. And so perhaps Takamitsu would say that the answer resides in sensing ma. So we see that in Moby Dick, Takamitsu has created an extremely flexible time structure and has forced the players to subtly negotiate the music's unfolding, a bit like what happens between a Taiyu and a shamisen player in Bunraku. Rain Tree is a percussion trio from 1981, and let's take a listen to that, and then I'll um, we'll look a little bit. We'll listen to uh, uh, the first two sections or so of it, um, since they're quite contrasting, and they do show something quite interesting about time.
that last slide. I didn't realize it was going to shrink like that. Well, was, uh, the, the point of that last slide was actually just show that third section, how we go back to something rhythmic. Um, so a glance at the... A glance at the first page of Rain Tree suggests music that's rhythmically loose, even indeterminate. But on closer examination, one sees that it isn't. Each bar can be counted as two beats at quarter note equals 60. And the rhythms that appear starting in the second system can be counted against that metrical framework. So this is actually, it looks quite loose, but actually it's quite fixed. Following this first section, which is defined by a progressive increase in rhythmic activity, <coughs> comes a section that, in fact, introduces improvisation in the parts of player A and B, while player C roughly maintains the regularity of the first section, albeit at a slower pace. Not quite a regular, but at least a sense of pulse. But of course, there's, there's um, polyrhythm here, which distorts that sense. So there's a sense of multiple speeds going on. While the first section passes a musical figure in a kind of pseudo-echo effect amongst the players, the second section layers the instruments. So with this shift in instrumental relationship, the sense of time changes as well. So where we had pulse before, kind of vertical alignment, now it gives way to streams or like layers of things, of activity happening simultaneously. And for a final example of some of these techniques, we look at Takamitsu's tree line. This is a work from 1988 for chamber orchestra, and I'll pay, play about half of it. Unfortunately, because it's a large score and everything, I, I didn't even um, attempt to put it here, so we don't have a score to follow, but we have some, some score um, excerpts and some score reductions that I've done. Um, so please listen as closely as you can to what, what's here. Um,
It's a long excerpt, but there's a, a lot of stuff in there that I wanted to, to there's several things I wanted to talk about there. Um, so uh, this piece brings together many of the compositional strategies we've seen in other pieces already. Yet the large ensemble instrumentation allows the composer to work even more extensively with timbre. So like in Moby Dick, we see irregular phrase lengths. Uh, in my analysis, for instance, the first phrase is 30 beats long, and the second is only six. The third is 38, the fourth is three, repeated once. And similarly, the fifth phrase is five beats, also repeated once. So this thing where we have a, a short phrase that gets has it sort of like an echo to it that we saw in Moby Dick, we see also here. So a lot of the similarity there in terms of phrase design. Um, I should note that the definition of phrase that I'm using in this analysis uh, is un a little untraditional. What I'm calling a f uh, the first phrase, for instance, is made up of several smaller phrases that are nested within a suspended and evolving harmony. And it's this harmony that I think defines the phrase. Yet one could argue that this chordal progression only defines a section. So uh, still, I, I hear the shorter phrases as only ephemeral gestures. And I sense that this analytical approach makes sense with Takamitsu's work, since, as the composer would describe it, there is a, quote, synchronic existence of differing flows of time. We definitely hear that in multiple sections in this piece. So note also that this relates uh, to the solo voice, uh, solo flute work voice that we heard earlier, in which there's an alternation of sustained notes and rapid melodic gestures. We have that, uh, for instance, this is sort of overlaid. You see this already here. I've, I've made this short, sort of short score where we have what I call the harmonic melodic field, melodic harmonic field, and then the harp figurations which are laid over that. Um, so look, looking closely at just the first page of the score, we can see a dynamic state of timbre that is so characteristic for Takamitsu. So here we have the score reduction of the first two bars. And the grand staff shows the pitch unfolding. Um, below that are the three harp figurations. Um, just a side note, I haven't added the microtonal tuning in the harp. There's actually a, the F should be an F quarter tone sharp, I think, in the harp. Um, almost all of the notes of the melodic harmonic field sound via a combination of an attack played by percussion, piano, or harp, and a sustain played by a wind or string instrument. Hence, there are two important components to the timbre of every note, the blend of the attack and sustained timbres, as well as the evolution of the sustained note. This evolution is usually defined by changes in the dynamics, so a crescendo or a decrescendo, but can also occur through instrumental change or even glissando. I think the best example of this then here is just the F, uh, is the C sharp. This is the sort of the instrumentation of just the C sharp on the first page. It starts in the double bass, at first played as a natural harmonic, and then tremolo is added as the piano also strikes this note, an alto flute enters with a glissando, first descending and then ascending back to the original note. And in beat three, double bass returns to ordinario sustain, while vibrato enters with tremolo along with muted horn. What we can't see in the score reduction is the shifting of harmony and density caused by the differing durations of notes, which with which Takamitsu shapes the next level of temporal experience. So situated between the individual note level, like this kind of thing, the, the sort of life of this individual note, and the phrase level, which I was talking about earlier. So like the crafting of the C sharp here that we've just seen, Takamitsu applies the same level of exacting craftsmanship to the dynamic state of harmony and density. It's a great balancing act, like that between the Taiyu shakuhachi player and puppeteer in Bunraku. Similar to what, we s we, what is seen in the improvised section of Rain Tree, Takamitsu crystallizes the music in, rain in tree line at rehearsal B. That's, that's um, where this excerpt is from. And he creates a backdrop that's frozen yet still moving. 
the sense of frozenness comes from the harmony. You'll see that everybody just keeps playing the notes that they have been given. Um, in brass, strings, percussion, celesta, and harp, the pitches assigned to them, with small exception in violin two and viola, don't change for 30 beats. Additionally, each instrument repeats its material, yet the sense of moving is caused by unique attack points among the instruments. So th here we have the pulse shifting to the bar level. Placed over this are layers of gestures in the woodwinds, which are not shown here, just imagine with me. So you have this as a kind of frozen um, backdrop that's sort of shimmering, and over that you have these series of melodic lines in the, in the winds. We would start first with the flute alone, and then accumulate with oboe, clarinet, and bassoon joining in. And it's quite a common layering technique. If you look at Takamitsu's music, you see this technique used constantly. These gestures do not correlate to the pulse established by the other instruments. So hence, the se a sense of improvisation arises, or at least a juxtaposition of freedom against regularity. A similar quality of frozenness. So I'd say in that, that previous one, actually everything is notated, but it's supposed to have this kind of spontaneity, this sort of these, these streams of things where we have this these, these frozen uh, backdrop and then these instruments moving at a different speed. But here we have, well, uh, what might look like improvisation. Um, we get, this is rehearsal D, or in rehearsal D. It's a similar quality um, that's found here of frozenness. Takamitsu utilizes improvisation like in Rain Tree. However, in this case, it's the solo instrument rather than the accompanying instruments that improvise. So we see lots of squiggly stuff there, and for those of us who study new music, you think, oh, that's like, I don't know, like Penderecki or something like that and from the 60s, and, and so it must be improvised. But um, it seems like indeterminate music, but in the brasses and the celesta, double bass, it's really not. It's just kind of a notational shorthand for something that just steadily repeats. Harp is improvised, but this is limited to a glissando over its scale, so it's not really anything other than a shorthand as well. However, the flute is instructed, you can't read it here, but it's instructed, instructed to quote, counter improvisation to the strings as birds calling, not periodical, with many spaces. And then he gives a sort of dynamic range. He gives a set of pitches the flutist can play. And so then we get these three layers. Um, here's the string part. So this is what's happening underneath. I've sort of broke it up so it's a bit more visible. So here in the, the, the flute, for instance, up here we have a solo line. Then we have this sort of, this backdrop of uh, this kind of frozen backdrop. And underneath that, then we have these melodic lines inside of the um, strings, but you'll also notice that it's got these components to it. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see here. Well, not so hard to see. Um, you'll, you'll find uh, that there are s not just similar chords, but, but a repetition of phrases. And so you have like these three layers of things that are happening, and they're actually three different times. This is a more, uh, more sort of not quite fixed metrical, but you have a sense of pulse. The other is completely frozen, and the other is completely free. So this string part is made with a few phrases involving repetition. And what results are these three temporal states, a solo improvisation, gestural phrasing in the strings, and a fragile s sustained backdrop in the other instruments. So to conclude with these four works discussed in this presentation, we see consistent compositional strategies used by Takamitsu to control the pace of time in his work. Time is crafted at multiple levels, the individual pitch or timbre level, the harmonic level, and finally the phrase level. Through these strategies, Takamitsu can achieve different flows of time simultaneously. The principles of Ma and Iki find a home in the composer's work, and I feel through understanding these principles, we can understand Takamitsu's music better. We can hear how unique and personal his compositional voice was. Thank you. Any questions or uh, comments? I haven't 
I haven't read anything. I'm sure he, he did, but what you, what you find a lot is, um, it seems to me when I look at the, the harmonic world is it's um, sort of very fam familiar mid 20th century stuff like right yeah possibly I also often see uh, octatonic and uh, various modes of limited transposition that's why I also see this French influence on the harmonic level there's this kind of French influence. And, and then there are also these moments which sound somehow a little bit like that, like La Mer or something like that so there's there is that kind of similarity, but at the same time, it's, it's definitely not, not that when you begin to look at it more closely yeah. and you begin to see how he, he strategizes like with, with coloring pitches and with, with um, designing his phrases, you see it's actually quite, quite different. But at, in the harmonic, at the harmonic level, it seems very yeah. sort of mid-century, early, early 20th century French. Yeah. Right. Right. True. Other questions? Mine was a has to do with um, people in Puerto Rico later, right? So um, um, his personality, his behavior, his behavior, his, yeah, and his speeches. Right. I would say also that that time period. Interestingly, if you look at Isang Yun pieces from the 1960s, so this was when I think 71 is when Voice was written, so pretty close to the 60s at least. And if you look at Isang Yun pieces from the 1960s, then you see this um, sort of uh, this this attempt to integrate with what was going on um, aesthetically in German music at that time. And at which produces what I find to be some of Isang Yun's most interesting pieces. But that wasn't what he w really wanted to do. And so by the time you get to the, by the 1980s, you begin to see much more of his own, his own voice. And there could be something similar going on with Takamitsu, the earlier pieces that are highly influenced by the West. And my understanding is actually his turn towards Japanese uh, traditional um, arts uh, actually resulted from a conversation with John Cage, or interaction with John Cage, um, which is kind of ironic, right? This American's like, you know what? You have really great stuff in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> how do you look at it? And um, it's, it's more or less how, how things went. And then he, he reflected on that and began, I think it was probably, at least what, I, what I've been reading, I mean, he knew of it, having just grown up in the culture, but then, it, it, was also part of his culture to sort of not pay attention to it. And then when he turned back to it, he saw what was really special there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's actually how it's written. I mean, it's from 1973. I think it's 1973, 74, something like that. And yeah, you have this, it's like the, you have the passages with Biwa and Shakuhachi, and then you have like orchestra parts. And, like, and it's more or less, not I don't think it's 100%, but it's more or less a kind of back and forth, somehow making a piece with these two entities that seem to never integrate. It's quite interesting. Okay. Oh, yes, you have a question. Um, so do you see this trip in like, you know, his other music, like in particular his electronic music? 
Uh, what electronic music? Uh, he did write some uh, music compositions or you know music of that nature, right? Music compositions. Uh, he might have. I'm not familiar with. I mean, a lot of people wrote a piece here and there, but I'm not familiar with the type of oh, music. Oh, but he did music. like um, invest. He did like you know write some like you know uh, electronic music. Like. So I was wondering if like you know these aesthetics, you know, these respects, these like you know time, uh, his conceptions of time, whether or not they are you know present in his you know electronic music. But I don't know his electronic music. Sorry. I don't know his electronic music. Oh. Okay. Chang, do you know? Do you know? Yeah, I'm not so sure. Oh. Do you know which? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, we have to ask Google. Okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the electronic pieces. Mm -hmm. um, it, like I mentioned, he did a lot of work in film as well, so that it's, it's very likely there's pop pieces and, and film pieces that were maybe done with synths and things like that. I'm not sure. I don't know that side of his work either. Oh, okay. So, um, so yeah, I can't really comment. Okay. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us, to, not just for my lecture, but for the whole uh, day of presentations. I hope it's been informative. It's been interesting for me, so I, I hope it's been interesting for you and informative. And I'll see you in a little bit for the four o'clock uh, lecture recital, where we hear some music by Morton Feldman and Luigi Nono, the Italian Luigi Nono. Okay, thank you.